Welcome back to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I'm your host, Lamont Gates, once again bringing you the world of faith, metaphysicality, and spirituality. Today, my guest has been a spiritual seeker all her life. In her mid-teens, she researched the major world religions and spiritual philosophies in search of truth. After researching 2,500 cases of near-death experiences, my guest was so delighted by what she learned that she wrote the book entitled, The Wonder of You, What the Near-Death Experience Tells You About Yourself. And it was through this research that my guest discovered answers to the more profound questions humans have asked since our ancestors lived in caves. Now... She has written another book entitled Beyond NDEs, The Next Step in Near-Death Experience Research. Joining me today, ladies and gentlemen, is Lynn Russell. Lynn, welcome to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Thank you. I'm enjoyed, really pleased to be here. That's very, great. very, very much glad to have you on. And actually, Lynn, you are the very first near-death experience researcher on this show. Typically, I just go for the actual experiencer, but it's very interesting to hear the research side of it because you're like, we're like the people looking from the outside in <laughs> versus those who are inside of the experience itself. Yes, exactly. So Lynn, first question I want to start off with is uh, for the general population, that is people who may not know what a near-death experience is. Can you help us define what a near-death experience is, because I think there's some confusion on there. For example, some people may say, you know, I hopped off of that side, walk quick enough before that 100 mile per hour bus came, avoiding that near-death experience. But that's <laughs> not what a near-death experience is at all. So can you help us with the definition of near-death experience? Well, a near-death experience is uh, when a person physically actually dies. Um there are, and it gets confused with out-of-body experiences, and people do have many out-of-body experiences during operations in the hospital or, or close calls and things like that, but uh, those aren't near-death experiences. Death experiences are when the heart stops and when the blood is no longer flowing and the brain is, every everything is stopping. And uh, they have to be resuscitated. But now you would say that uh, an out-of-body experience in some way is connected to a near-death experience, because it seems that a lot of people who have a near-death experience may go through the out-of-body experience before they transfer into something more otherworldly, would you say? Yes, exactly. Yes, and that's why it gets confused, because sometimes they don't go to the tunnel. They're dead, they're being resuscitated, but they're staying at this level. So it really is very confusing. Yes, it is. And I want to thank you for clarifying that for us. Now, your book entitled Beyond NDEs, The Next Step in Near-Death Experience Research covers several characteristics that an experiencer would encounter during an NDE. I'd like to describe some of these characteristics. First, you have a chapter on what happens after death, where you state, quote, in North America, death has been treated as an unnatural invader, an enemy to be conquered. Can you tell us what your research actually says about death in regards to near-death experiences? Well, uh, yes, we we really do struggle against uh, death, and and it's it's a shame because well, it isn't a shame. I mean, we we not it's a natural uh, instinct to try and want to stay around as long as possible. But there's a great deal of research now on um, extending the life and, and making us live longer and longer into longevity. And um, there's one fellow that I can't remember his name, but he thinks that the child who will live 1,000 years has been born. And he's a person that works on this kind of thing. So, yeah, there's a there's a whole um, struggle against death, and doctors will do almost anything to keep a person going when actually it, it's best if they just leave it alone and let them go. 
especially in light of uh, near-death experience research, because uh, what we're learning from it is that there's really nothing to fear, would you say? I agree. It's a beautiful experience based on what we're told. I had a tiny experience, but it, I didn't get to go beyond the tunnel and I was sent right back. So I don't have a lot to say about that. But yes, it's, it's, um, it is a beautiful experience. And I have not talked, except for people who have negative experiences, um, I have not talked to anybody who has not enjoyed it and wanted to stay there. And with that said, uh, very often near-death experiencers, when they do cross over, they may travel through a tunnel where they are met by a light. You stated in your book, many people equated the luminous light in general terms to a higher being that left them spellbound. Can you tell us what this light is and what its importance is in near-death experiences? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, what the light is, is that, that people repeatedly come, when they come back, they repeatedly tell us that the light is the source, the creative force, the, uh, the, what, what, what this is all about or coming from. Um, and so that, that's basically what the light is. But some people enter into the light. A lot of people don't. They see it from afar. And but the odd person does get into sight the light, and some talk to the talk to the light and have a conversation. They learn how creation happens, um, and they learn other kinds of information about the light. But there are others that these are the ones that I get excited about that actually. They, they almost melt into the light and become the light. And they become creators themselves. And they, are, they go back to the beginning and they create with the light. And those are the ones that I think are just so exciting. And I think a lot of people or many people who've had near-death experiences may equate this light with... Uh... God, you know, something that they are familiar with in their own religions. Have you seen any of that in your near-death experience research? Yes, many people will ask the light, are you God? Um, and the light rarely says yes. It really identifies itself with one specific idea of, of, the, of the higher power. Um, it it's very keeps itself very broad. And so it will say, yes, I'm the creative force, or yes, I'm I'm the source of all you know, or that kind of thing. But it I, uh, never says the word God or Allah or, you know, any of those other words. Right, right. It's almost as if it's being neutral to the question. Well, yes, I think so. Yes, yeah. I also understand that love plays a massive role in most near-death experiences. In fact, you stated in your book that love in the afterlife was such a constant element of the near-death experience that this book could easily have been written on that topic alone. Why don't you talk to us about what your research has uncovered concerning this indescribable love experiencers feel while they're having a near-death experience? Yes, they, they, they're not, I, not very many people don't talk about the love. They just are so overwhelmed by this amazing amount of love that just wants them. And um, one woman said every cell in her body was correct by love. And I thought that was so um, eloquent, but also expresses a lot of what. But beyond that, beyond the feeling of love, which is what, where we are, we see love as an emotion or, um, you know, something like that. But, but at the spirit level, um, when we're the ones who are in God, in this, in this, this light, find out that the light is actually the energy, the essence of the light. And this source has created everything. And everything is created with love. Everything. The, the love is the energy that creates. And um, so that's that's pretty cool. So that means that you and I are love. 
it also means that the planets are love. <laughs> wow, you know, I, I think that's one of the things we all need, right? <laughs> love, whether we yes. admit it or not. Yes. Uh, in addition to the light and love that many experiencers feel during uh, a near-death experience, you also point out that there are universal elements which yeah. refer to the similarity of experiences that are encountered. Can you tell us what a few of these elements are? Uh, well, some of them we've, we're well aware of. There's no time uh, that uh, we can uh, communicate with tele telepathy, telepathically, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so we can communicate through our minds and, and um, thought. And, and we can travel instantly from one place to another but other things that that they they don't talk about is um that there is no genders there's only source and soul and that's it there's no male or female there is also no disabilities because we don't bring our our bodies with us and so there's no body to have disabilities. And so anybody who has um, had a problem at this level is free of pain, is, is, it can dance and, and, and hear and see and do all the things that we can do. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones but I'm blanking out. Well, you actually stated something very interesting. You said there is no time. And I always found that fascinating when I interviewed a near-death experiencer. Very often they will tell me that past, present, and future all touch one another. So in some way, shape, or form, these things are all simultaneously happening in the now. Yeah, yeah, yes. And, and you know, time is human thing or a, or a, a, a physical world thing. Um, because we need time and space to be able to have a, an experience as a as a physical being, and so um, time and space are exclusively for physical, and so that's why there's none there because we're no longer physical. Yeah, we're... but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that because. Um, it, we are source, source, we are source, and source doesn't know time, there's no time with source, so we are that creative energy. Yeah, and we, you know, are programmed almost to think in a linear fashion, when in reality, uh, spirituality and the source are completely outside of both time and space. Uh, yeah. Now, one of my favorite aspects of the near-death experience is the life review. Uh, concerning the life review, in your book, you wrote, as though caught in movie reruns, every aspect of their lives was examined from birth to the time of their deaths. Talk to us more in detail about the life review and its significance during a near-death experience. Yeah, so I found that people who have had a life review come back very different from people who haven't had the life review, um, they are more self. They're more conscious of others. They're more conscious of the world and and their effect that they're having on the on each other in the world. And um, but the other thing about the life review is that when a person is having the life review, they, nothing is left out. So they see both the negative and the positive of, of their own actions, but they also feel what the person felt like that they were dealing with and what the person that they were dealing with, the people that he dealt with or she. And so it goes out like an echo until it fades. The life review for me is very fascinating because it also teaches us uh, where we could have probably improved in relations or, or incidents we had with other people. Uh, and that's why I believe you see be these people coming back much more different than people who do not have a life review, for example. Uh, furthermore, I want to go backwards and talk to you about uh, what you were discussing previously about this oneness. Um, as discussed in your book, 
Uh, most religious adherents, especially from a westernized religious worldview, always seem to see God or the source as separate from any and all things. But this isn't so cut and dry with near-death experiencers. Can you explain why the concept of an isolated God may be at odds with near-death experiences? Um, as I talked about with people who have entered into the light, they when they go into the light and they melt and become the light, they realize that they that's their source. That's where they came from. That's where they they belong. Um, and and that's where they will return to when we finish our evolution. Um, and we'll talk about that later about reincarnation. But when we finish our evolution of uh, lives, and 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 get to the point where we are that we understand the the depth of our spiritual reality, then we become the light, and that we return to the light, and that's the and and so that's that's the source. That's where we came from. That's where we belong, and there is nothing else. There's only one source. There's only one. Um, one spirit, one, one, one creator, and right. we are it. We are it. We belong to it. And every every single person, and this talking about universal elements, every single one tells us about how they felt they were part of everything, and everything was part of them. That they were one with everything, and that is huge. That's a huge part of the whole experience because it's back to being one with everything. Yeah. And, and so that, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. My understanding based on, you know, reading several near death experiences and interviewing these uh, experiencers is that we are nothing more than particles of this massive light. For example, if you were to bring a mirror in and smash it into a million pieces, those million pieces are still that one mirror that was whole just a few minutes ago. So yes, exactly. th this is this is the idea of who we are as spiritual beings who just happen to be having a human experience. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we and we we need to have this experience because we're giving back to the source in in the in the living of our everyday lives. We are giving back to the source, which is us, which is ourselves. Mm -hmm. As you and I very well know, near-death experiences have occurred quite often due to an individual who has committed or attempted to commit suicide. In fact, you cited a medical publication in your book that stated the majority of people who commit suicide don't want to die. They just want to stop their anguish. What has your research uncovered about suicide and near-death experiences? Yeah, the bottom line of suicide is you don't get out of whatever it is you're trying to avoid. Whatever you're trying to avoid, you still have to face it, either in a new life or come back here, or that you can you can work it out at the spirit level, although that's very painful because you have to go over and over and over the situation that brought you to suicide. Um, to try and think about how you would deal with that differently. And they're repeatedly told, um, this is not a choice you have. And with that said, uh, another type of near-death experience is known as the hellish or distressing near-death experience. Now, you stated in your book that not many near-death experiences fit into the hellish category, that may be because those experiences took people into regions that would terrify the devil himself. Can you give us examples of a hellish experience? And has your research determined why these distressing accounts happen at all? One of the nice things, or I guess it's not nice, but one of the interesting things about um, hellish experiences is that they're all different. And that's significant because death experiences, NDEs, are quite the same. They're so much alike. And with death, ex with hellish experiences, there's no two that are alike. And so 
that that's significant because when a person is in a hellish experience and they are brought out of that experience and and there are different ways of that happening they can either say a prayer um there was one man who didn't didn't go to church, didn't, wasn't religious at all. But he remembered Jesus saves us. J Jesus saves me from the child when he sang that. So he started singing that and he was out. Um, sometimes they just call, get me out of here, you know. So those kind of things, the ways of, of getting out of this horrible experience. Um, but the main point is that those who get out will say, what was that all about? You know, they're blown away. And um, they're told, that is your creation. You created that for yourself because that's what you thought you deserved. And one of the saddest things, because as I mentioned before, we are the light and we are a part of the light, and that is home. And repeatedly, people who have had death experiences say that's home they're going home and um and it's such a shame that these beautiful ex these people these beautiful souls have judged themselves so badly that they refuse to go to the light because they feel that they don't deserve it and so i think that's painful and and so sad Yes, indeed. And uh, speaking of the different types of hellish near-death experiences, as you mentioned earlier, I believe it was an author by the name of Nancy Evans Bush who had a hellish experience herself. Her and uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson, psychiatrist and father of near-death experience research, as he's so often called, came up with three types of hellish experiences, and they labeled them type one, two, and three. So I, I see your point when you talk about no two hellish NDEs are the same. In fact, no two NDEs in general are the same, but I do think that each has a tailored message for the individual. Yes, yes. Now, yes, it's, yeah, go ahead. You no, know, go go ahead. You, did you want to make a comment? I, was, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> okay. All right. So a controver another controversial concept, mainly within many mainstream traditional Abrahamic faiths, is reincarnation. Now, despite this controversy, reincarnation seems to appear in near-death experience accounts quite often. Can you talk to us about how reincarnation fits into the near-death experience narrative? Yes, I mean it is. It's a it's it people often see when they're on the other side, they see the lives that they had before. And um they often are are know that they're the people who have had um, committed suicide will be told that they're going to go to another they can choose to go to a different life but they have to have all the same elements that are the same but the point is the the the, the um, reincarnation that we give our existence is giving to the source and we need to continue to give to the source perpetually because it helps the source to be and to understand itself. And so um, we would never not be a, a, some other kind of, whether it's physical or, or in another dimension that we don't understand. Um, we, we are always going to be coming back and, and living again in this life, in this world or elsewhere. And, you know, the inter interesting thing about uh, the religious mainstreams who see reincarnation as just an Eastern type of philosophy or religion um, reminds me of a guest that I once interviewed who was a devout Christian. She was grown up in a Christian church, Protestant Christian church. Her uncle, her parents were ministers. She had a heart attack one day, had a near-death experience, and found out that she had past lives. Not only did she find out that she had past lives, she was actually able to go back into each one of them and oh. see what it was that was causing a lot of the trauma in her life today. So oh. you talk so you talk about time not existing, being able yeah. to go back into a time period of ancient Egypt 
and having that tie to your personal life it yes. adds a lot of credence to what we're saying about the existence both of near death experience and the lack of time existing on that side yeah that's yeah. right yeah yeah so with that said you have an interesting chapter called Slight of Mind that describes this earthly life as not being as real as the spiritual realm. In fact, you stated in your book that the ego personalities we carry around during our lifetimes are nothing more than temporary passports into life. Whether good or bad, our egos are simply illusions. What does your research have to say about how serious we take certain issues in this life and should we take them so serious? Yeah, we are. That, 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 that's right. And what's more, science is supporting that, um, that this is an illusion. Um, Einstein said that time and space are the same thing. And quantum physics is showing that, uh, that the universe is two-dimensional and holographic. So that sort of gives credence to this illusion il in, in, illustration. But it's true. We are. This is just an illusion. And many, many, many death experience people who have had a death experience come back and tell us that. Um, in, and, and so, yes, we do take this life so seriously. And the other part of that is that we are creators. And we really need very strongly to understand that role because we, we create all that we've seen. Everything we have created through thought and through consciousness. And it's up to us, the world that we're going to be living in. And, you know, and all of that fits together. And it kind of goes back to your explanation on hellish near-death experiences. Perhaps the way we saw this world, the worldview we had here, uh, albeit most likely a negative one, is probably probably what brought us into that hellish element or near-death experiencers who had hellish near-death experiences into those hellish realms because they created it, as you just stated. That's exactly. Yes. And that's what they're told when they are taken out of the hellish experience. They're told that this is your creation. You did this. And the same with this, this existence. I tell people in my books, we create the death experience we're going to have. But it's exactly the same way we create this experience. Yeah. Yeah. Quite fascinating indeed. Uh, finally. I want to talk to you about uh, what life is like for the near-death experiencer who returns from a near-death experience, especially after having a positive one. What can you tell us from your research on what occurs after one returns from a near-death experience? Yes, it's very difficult for some. Some blend right back in again and, you know, bounce back out in and they're fine and have no trouble at all. But other people... Um, it, it's a, such a difficult adjustment to come back from this because the, the existence over on the other side is so much more real than here. And we talked about the illusion. Um, there, it, things are sharper, they're clearer, they, you know, it's much more real than here. And um, so when they come back, they they can't connect with this world because it's, artificial it's not real and um, so that's one of the issues the other issue is that they give up on they don't care about um, materialism they really don't care about money and having and all of those things are irrelevant what they care about is the world and the and other people and making the world a better place and that is their prime directive is to make this world a better place. And so that's another thing. And what happens is that a very high percentage of end of years winds up with a divorce, unfortunately, because the, the partner can't relate to what's happened. And so that if you if you have someone who the partner is very materialistic and you have someone who says, I don't care about it, 
you know, that can cause problems as well. Oh, I bet it can. <laughs> you know, who wants to give up that Lamborghini and that $2.5 million mansion that you just bought yesterday before your near-death experience? <laughs> now you're coming back telling us to move into a one-bedroom apartment <laughs> because you're so modest now. But yes, I believe that when they come back with that kind of information, they are focused on the things that actually matter. Remember, we talked about sleight of mind. Most things really don't matter. The the rat race that we think matters, as much money that we make, we think all of this matters, the size of the house, et cetera. When they come back, they're focused on focusing on things that actually do matter, such as relationship, uh, kindness, mercy, yes. uh, love yes. in general. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I just this morning read um, a science research that when the people are looking for the, the most successful um, relationships are the ones who entail kindness and caring and respect and those kind of things. And it has nothing to do with money or prestige. It makes a lot of sense to me. Now, I know, Lynn, that you are also working on another book, if I'm not mistaken. Can you give us the title of that and where we can find it? Yeah, that's Warpole. It's actually one of my favorite books because it's uh, it's for preteens, and it's it's a it's an adventure. It's a novel, and it's um helps teens to make a better decision. So the the character, the the main person, whose name is Cam, Cam um learns that uh that we are all one. It's a spirit. It has a spiritual overtones. He learns that um, anger bounces back at you. And he also learns that kindness and caring are so vitally important and powerful in the world. And he also learns that love is the most powerful thing in the universe. Yeah. Sounds just like a, a book up the near-death experience alley. Uh, why don't you tell us where you, we can find that book as well as your current book, Beyond NDEs? Yeah, they're both on um, on, on Amazon. Well, I just want to say I read Beyond NDEs. You gave me a copy of it before we uh, conducted this interview, and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think near-death experience uh, enthusiasts out there who are very interested in learning about more of the characteristics of near-death experiences will certainly enjoy this book as well. And and I would just like to tell people a couple of things before I go. Uh, one is that how magnificent you really are. I mean, if you think about that you're the creator expressing yourself in this form um how can you not be magnificent so that's that's one of the things the other thing is that thought every single thing in your life came from thought originally so really pay attention to the thoughts that go through your mind because they really matter well, with that said, Lynn, I want to thank you for coming on Real Spiritual Talk Radio and sharing with us your fascinating research. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed our chat. <laughs> Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Russell. Thank you.